and, and that's what I tell people. I said, what if I told you that all the mythologies, you know, Hercules, Achilles, all these beings, that they were real, that they really existed because these, and the Bible even kind of alludes to that because it says that the Nephilim were men of renown. And so it's telling you these guys were super famous in antiquity. And what I say is that these, this, the mythologies of which you mentioned, Greece, Rome, they, they were all based on this real event in Genesis 6. 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 The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. Enjoy the journey. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chair. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop is just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. All right, welcome to the show, Ryan Peterson. Um, you're a biblical researcher, a writer. You have a JD from Columbia Law University. You you were a practicing attorney in Wall, on Wall Street and a corporate attorney at one point, and then you wrote a book called The Judgment of the Nephilim. How did you transfer from being a corporate attorney to go writing a book about the giants? That's interesting to me. Yeah, great question. So it was really uh, just it, it was it was really I really attributed it to God that really led, led me down this road because at the, at, at my, when I was in my career, my start of my career working in law and working on wall street, you know, it was, um, you know, from a worldly standpoint, kind of like the pinnacle, you know, I reached the mountaintop. I finished law school, had a great job, was very materially successful, but spiritually very empty for sure. It was a very spiritually empty time in my life. And I was just kind of, you know, living in the biggest, you know, the, capital city of the world and living like a heathen, basically just having fun, doing whatever I want, my friends traveling and all those things. And what, you know, having been growing up a Christian, I, my faith never left me, but what really kind of convicted me and led me to the Nephilim was Bible prophecy, because that was something I had not really discussed or studied much when I was young. And then I was someone who was always super into politics, super into politics, follow politics closely. I worked in the Senate before. Once I stumbled upon some of these websites that deal with these type of more fringe Christian topics, like and uh, like the end times, the Antichrist, these things, I didn't. It, it really blew me away to see how world events were converging with Bible prophecy. That it's like, wow, there are things happening in the world in the news, and the Bible has called this from two thousand years ago, and so. Through that, I started looking at all my ministries, buying DVDs and documentaries, and I got one about the Nephilim. Knew nothing about Genesis 6, the supernatural interpretation of it. And once I got into it and learned, it just kind of changed my whole perspective on the Bible and how I saw the Bible. And, and so many things in the Bible made more sense to me. And so from that point, kind of the research, evidentiary writing experience that God gave me in my professional career, I just kind of channel it all into researching this topic and really trying to make a book that can show that you can, that, that there's no doubt that the Nephilim, as we know them, supernatural, that the offspring, these hybrid offspring of fallen angels and human women, that you can establish this from the Bible alone. So you can, something you can take to any church, anyone, any small group and know that just from the Bible, this is a act, this is actual biblical history, not just mythology. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of what you do. You don't, you don't, you don't necessarily need the the extra biblical literature to make sense of these these characters in the story. Mm. And I think some people are weird about that. They don't like the extra biblical literature. They feel like it's not God inspired or whatever. But uh welcome to the show. It's gonna be hard today to probably not talk about politics with all the craziness going on in the world. <laughs> um, we're gonna try not to. We're not really a politics yeah, show, yeah. but uh it's gonna it always comes out somehow. But but one thing we ask all our guests right away is what are your thoughts on Bigfoot? 
What do you think it is? Where do you think it comes from? And, or do you have any thoughts? Definitely. So I think, you know, you know, I, I think that when you look at Bigfoot, even creatures from mythology, you know, the centaur, the minotaur, in ancient Egypt, you, you know, you have Anubis, half dog, half man, these half, these hybrid animal human creatures. I don't think they're just all figments of imagination that the, the Egyptians just built these magnificent, incredibly, incredible structures um, to just pure figments of their imagination. I think these were real beings. I think they all come back to Genesis chapter six, that what was taking place that in Genesis six was the, this, you know, what we call the incursion or the invasion of these fallen angels who essentially came to earth and started messing with human and animal genetics. And that, that's not as discussed when we talk about the Nephilim, is that in Genesis 6 and Genesis 7, the te- what the Bible says is that all flesh had corrupted itself. So the animals, too, were corrupted. And I think, you know, certainly the hmm. extra biblical text, like the book of Jasher, says that explicitly. But I think that the angels were also tampering with animal genetics and this hybrid, hybrid program. And so... When you see something like Bigfoot or, or the other creatures I mentioned, I think these are offshoots of that. And now, could the, when we see Bigfoot today, I think it's one of two things. Either the, obviously it could be that creature or a spiritual manifestation of that creature, like the, the, the spirit of him. Because I think the Nephilim spirits are mostly the demons of today. And so they can, and, they, and we know angels can masquerade and shapeshift. You know, the, the Bible tells us that Satan masquerades as the angel of light. And his ministers as ministers of light. So um, it's one of the two. But I bring all that back to Genesis 6. So I think when people are seeing Bigfoot today, it's no different than the ancients seeing these hybrid beings. And how do you think they did that? I mean, do you think that they had ancient test tubes or do you think they took, they shape shifted and took the form of a primate and, and interbreeded with these things? I, I, I think either is possible, right? So one example I think that is really um, always fascinated me from the Bible is uh, in Daniel chapter four with King Nebuchadnezzar, where we see that he is transformed into a human animal hybrid for seven years. And it's said that this is by decree of the watcher, the watcher angels, the same angels that the book of Enoch said were responsible for the Genesis six invasion. And he is literally transformed. He lives as an animal. He grows claws, has feathers, fur, and he, he isn't a human animal hybrid. And so um, I think it could have been through just a cult angelic power and that they transformed or through actual some physical means. I think it either is possible. Daniel also talks about, of course, the fact that in the end times, you know, in Daniel chapter two is that the end times kingdom says they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. So there's, there's this whole prophetic notion that the fallen angels are going to attempt this once again, a literal genetic hybridization mm. program with humanity. That's funny that you say that because that's my thoughts. So the last couple of guests have been talking about the chimera, the chimerical creatures. And I've been listening to podcasts about Bigfoot for the last decade. And I, ne- I never understood the chimerical creatures. I always thought mythology was just mythology. It wasn't actually like a preservation system for history. But now I'm thinking maybe Bigfoot is, you know, has this uh, spirit father and, and animal mother. It's interesting. Uh, I uh, you know, and that's something that's come up a lot is that there are some chimerical creatures discussed in the Bible that uh, that you hint at just now. Are there any other creatures that that the Bible talks about and that you think that are that could have been roaming around back then? Uh, yeah, you know, they so in certain translations of scripture they talk about um, you know satyrs in scripture that will be in when Babylon is destroyed, mystery Babylon, that says satyrs will dance there. So they, there's, again, this reference to kind of hybrid creatures. And then my, my newest book, so I completed the sequels to Judgment of the Nephilim. So Judgment of the Nephilim really is focusing on the Old Testament, the days of Noah, the flood, and explaining to people that this is what the flood was all about. It was about God basically rescuing the human genome, to preserving us so we can be saved by a human Messiah. The new book deals all in the end times, and it's called, it's called The Final Nephilim. And the whole thesis of the book is that the final Nephilim will be the Antichrist, right? So that he himself is a hybrid. Mm. And, you know, it's interesting if you look in Revelation 13, it goes back and forth from calling him a man and a beast. He's called the beast, but he has the number of a man. And back, because it's kind of this back and forth description. And he's, they say, who is, unlike, who is like the beast? But then at the same time, they say that... Uh, 
you know, his number, the mark of the beast is the number of a man, number 666. So I think it's all alluding to him being a hybrid. And then, of course, this all goes back to Genesis chapter three, where God tells the devil that he's going to put set this war between the seed of the woman, Eve, who's Jesus Christ, and his seed. So it's telling you explicitly that the devil is going to have a seed. So there will be a final hybrid who, will, who I think will be the answer. And then he's supposed to be resurrected too. So that does sort of play into that whole thing as well, right? Definitely. Definitely. That he, you know, receives a mortal wound that he is resurrected from. And of course, he's, he, he's deceiving the world to think that he is Jesus. The whole plan is that the, for the world to believe he is the Christ. So you have this hybrid being who then is resurrected from the dead. And then, and then on top of that, it says that there's a spirit the beast spirit is what indwells him that comes from the bottomless pit. It says that the, this, the, you know, the, and I believe that's, that, that is Apollyon when it says that the fifth trumpet, the abyss is open, which is the prison of these same angels that committed fornication with human women in the days of Noah. It says it's opened and these locusts, these hybrid creatures, right? It says that these locusts emerge from the abyss and, uh, You know, it says that they have the face of a man, hair of a woman. They have wings like locusts, teeth like lions. So they are totally going back again to when we think about a minotaur, a centaur. These are hybrid creatures that come and torment the world for five months. But then it says also that they have a king over them, the king of the bottomless pit. And it says in Hebrew, his name is Abaddon, in Greek, Apollyon. And I believe that that fallen spirit will possess the Antichrist after his, at his resurrection. So he'll one, be a hybrid and two, be possessed. And so in a way, he's kind of the fulfillment of what we've been talking about. Like he'll be a hybrid like Nebuchadnezzar who ruled for seven, who was a, a, a man beast for seven years. The Antichrist will be in power for seven years or have a three and a half year rise and then three and a half years as the full global ruler. And then also to be possessed um, the way he's, Judas was. So Judas, of course, the who betrayed Jesus, he was possessed by Satan. Says so Satan went into him at the moment he betrayed mm. Christ and went and sold mm. him out to the Pharisees. So I think it's going to be a similar, the Antichrist is like both of those put together. I, yeah, I always have to speak for the voice of the skeptics. How do you know, a lot of people, a lot of my friends think that a lot of this stuff already happened. And and then a lot of people, yeah, sure. a lot of people would say, well, if if the plan's this clearly laid out, how, how could, you know, how, why wouldn't the enemy just read this book and then um, know what not to do? Or I don't know. What do you, what do you say to those people that think that way? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I think that's a, that's a, that's a very legitimate objection. I think it's good to question these things. Right. So in terms of the first part, um, and this is kind of how I kind of measure Bible prophecy when people say, well, when do you think things are going to happen? I kind of look at what the Bible says in revelation and then think, what is there that's being said that can be achieved today. And in, in the easiest thing to look at is the mark of the beast. I mean, man, I mean, we're talking, I think Revelation was written in 96 AD. Some people think it was written in 65 AD, but we're talking the first century AD, first century technology. And yeah. John writes about the mark and says that no one on earth, everyone has to receive it. Nothing can be bought or sold without a mark in your hand. I mean, that is something that is on you. You can't fathom that even in, even in 1930, 1940, you cannot fathom an economic system where everyone in the world buys something simply through a mark in their hand. That's not, that's, that's something that you couldn't achieve until the last 10 years. Right. The connectedness of, of, of the world, right? Like to be able to, yeah, you need, you know, RFID technology, you need Wi-Fi, you need satellites, you need internet broadband, you need all those things to achieve that. I mean, he wrote that 2000 years ago. That's that, that you could not, that's something that you'd only find in a sci-fi movie until the last decade. So I don't think that could have happened anytime before. So, so that, that, that I think removes that from saying, Hey, this happened 200 years ago. Then to so the second part, well, if the enemy knows, I think that with everything that God has an interesting way of dealing with the devil and the fallen angels, that it's almost like God basically is, giving permission at certain times for the devil to do certain things. And we see that the easiest example is in the book of Job. I mean, they just talk about the fact that the devil wants to, God kind of says, have you thought about Job? So as someone you can go menace and Satan says, I can't, I can't touch him. You put a hedge of protection around him. He had a supernatural barrier around him from the fallen angels. Yeah. And God says, okay, I'll remove it, but you can't kill him. You know? So it's always, so it's almost like they have certain times and, there are certain times and seasons where God is going to allow the devil to do something. And I think at the, 
we know eventually there's going to be a war in heaven because Satan is allowed into heaven. He goes into heaven. He speaks to God in God's throne, but a day is going to come where he fights a war against the archangel Michael and he's kicked out. He's evicted permanently. And when he comes to earth, that's the time he's allowed to raise up the antichrist. So I think that, yeah, the enemy, does the devil know that? Probably. God told him how exactly how things were going to end. He said, the seed of the woman is going to crush your head and I want to put war between him and your child. So the, the devil has known the, the ultimate fulfillment of this from the Garden of Eden. Yeah. I always think this interesting, it goes on in my mind, is that you grow up in the church and there's sort of this uh, weird exegesis way we read the scripture where we, we edit out all this stuff. Yeah. And you have this age of empiricism right now where everyone's thinking super rationally and no one includes these creatures, especially the giants of old. Why do you think that is? How come some people can see the Narnia in the Bible and some can't? Yeah, two two reasons, really. I think the first reason is more of a uh, more of an educational theological reason. When, at the turn of the century, I'm sorry, the turn of the century, at the turn of the 20th century, you know, there was a big push in the church because of... Uh, the British Enlightenment movement with evolution, Darwin, Aldous Huxley, who were really anti-Christian and trying to disprove the Bible in every way and pushing evolution. There was a big push in the church to remove a lot of the more supernatural aspects from scripture. Well, not to remove them, but not to teach them in seminaries. And so pastors, you had generations of pastors that didn't know anything about the Nephilim. If you go back, because I, I love old books, you know, I'm old school. I, I love old books. I love old sources. And if you go back to an old Schofield Bible from the 19 teens, you go to Genesis 6, it's set, it, in, the, in the reference section, it's going to tell you right in the margins that these were giants. These were the Nephilim. It says it ex explicitly. So that was the common teaching in the church up until that time. And then as, as a way to kind of combat evolution and not make Christianity seem so uh, unbelievable, unempirical, they kind of moved, they shot away from it. And I think in the modern church, what, hap you know, what happens today is that so much of the modern church is watered down Christianity. That's just kind of focused on how can I help your life, help your, your marriage, help you look better, get lose weight and all these things. And so Bible, pro it's so person, me, me, me focused that we've lost that urgency of Bible prophecy. You know, pastors would much rather teach you what are three steps to help your life this week than saying, hey, we should be living our lives like Christ can come get us any day. And then the importance of telling the world that the tribulation can start at any moment. So we need to get people on the ark before the flood starts, so to speak. And so that's it. Unfortunately, a lot of, the, a lot of pastors just don't want to teach because it doesn't, um, it doesn't bring in the crowds like they think it will, like, like other sermons. Yeah, I, and I, so I would love to go back because some of the things you write about um, in your book, uh, The Judgment of Nephilim, I know you're writing a new book like you referenced, but you talk a lot about the beginnings of this. And that's something I think with a lot of our the guests we've had previously, we didn't really talk about like the very beginning. And some things you cover in this book, super interesting about like the location where the angels enter the human realm. And because a lot of people talk about Mount Hermon and there was a, you know, the Council of Kings and everything that supposedly happened there. Can we start a little bit from the beginning? Would you mind just to kind of walk us through the stuff that, that you've extrapolated from all this? Or yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. So again, and I, and I love that because I, I really, I'm glad you said that because that was a big uh, kind of goal of mine with the book was to say, okay, let's go back to Genesis and go slow. I call it like the book is like a slow drive through the, the creation of humanity and this and the start of this war. Because I think there are little details in scripture that are so important. And I, and I felt like people weren't talking about them, which so I wanted to make sure we got it out there in the discourse. And so um, starting with, you know, we talked about already Genesis 3 and the prophecy, what I call the ultimate prophecy, Genesis 3.15, when God told the devil, you know, that the seed of the woman was going to defeat him. I think that is what, that was what led to everything that takes place in the early history of the Bible, because now Satan knew I, there's going to be a human son born who's going to come and conquer me. And I got to either destroy this child, prevent his birth, or corrupt him in some way. And I think that's what led to the events. And I talk about, I try to let people think about these things. Think about what's happening in the Garden of Eden from the angelic perspective, right? So if you, Satan hears this prophecy, obviously the woman is Eve. And then what happens? She has two sons, Cain and Abel. And so I say, from, from a fallen angelic perspective, Cain could have been the Messiah, he was the firstborn seed of the woman. 
And so what happens? So the devil, he gets, he gets corrupted. He's wicked. We know from Hebrews it says he had no faith when he made his offering to God. And what does he do? He kills his brother. So it was like a two for one shot that the devil took at two potential messiahs, right? These were potential. They both could have potentially been the messiah, Cain or Abel. God then says, okay, I'm going to separate Cain and get him out of Eden altogether. Set him, get him away to allow the third son, Seth, to continue the, the messianic bloodline without Cain's interference. And so now we see human population starts growing. So Satan can no longer just say, I'm, I'm pick off one potential Messiah at a time. And the thing is, when you get to Genesis 6, you know, we know that's the chapter where we see the, the sons of God, the angels taking daughters of men. But the, it starts off by saying, when men began to multiply upon the earth and daughters were brought unto them. So it was the growth of the population that led the devil to now re-strategize and go for a wide scale attack on humanity. And that's what I think led to the birth of the Nephilim. And in terms of the first family, who I call the first family of the Nephilim, I look to the lineage of Cain and in the seventh generation in Lamech, and this is again is Lamech, the evil Lamech, not Lamech, the father of Noah. This is in Genesis four. I believe it's his generation where this started. And there's something very interesting in scripture is that when you look at the genealogies, you know, of, of any of the patriarchs, especially in the early books of the Bible, it's just usually you might have three generations in one verse. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob and so on. But there are certain figures in, in biblical history who will get multiple verses devoted to just their generation. And when you get to Lamech, he's the first one you see where there's six verses that just devoted to him and every member of his family is described. And I think there are several reasons why we can know this, this was the family where it first happened, where the fallen angels made this transaction for a human woman. One is that Lamech was the first polygamist on record. He had two wives, Ada and Zillah. And we, all, we know from his, from his introduction, he, he brags about killing somebody. So he's definitely not a believer. And then mocks God because he says, when Cain, when Cain killed Abel, God in his mercy put the mark, a mark on him to say, if anyone basically messes with you or harms you, they'll know from this mark that I will avenge you sevenfold. Lamech kills somebody and says, if anyone harms me, they'll be avenged 70 and sevenfold. So he's mocking that. So he had no faith in God whatsoever. And then you see a description of his sons. And in his son's generation, he had three sons, we see this technological explosion. So you have Jabal, mm. who was the father of tent making and animal husbandry. Jubal, his second son, was the, he, was the, he was the creator of instruments and music. I mean, he created instruments. I mean, this is um, one of the greatest inventions in human history, the instruments and music. And so even the Jubilee, the term the Jubilee is based from the same root of his name. And then you have Tubal Cain, who, of course, is named after Cain, who was the father of blacksmithing, forging tools, forging weapons, things to make humanity more self-reliant, less reliant on God. So you have all this technology in one generation. And then it says the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. And Nama, so first of all, she's the first sister mentioned at all in scripture. And um, so this really goes against the whole pattern of genealogies you see in the Bible up to this point. Even when you look at the women, you know, in the, you, know you have about 1,656 years of history from Adam, the creation of Adam to the flood. And there are four women mentioned by name in the Bible in that whole history. Eve and the three women from this family, Ada, Zillah, and Nama. So to me, God is telling us something incredibly important happened in this particular family. And I think this was the generation where the fallen angels made this transaction of, you know, forbidden knowledge. They gave humanity, this family, this technology, this knowledge in exchange for Nama's hand in marriage. And of course, Nama means beautiful. And we see in Genesis 6, as the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took wives of them all, which they chose. And so I think that this is the family. I think the Bible is telling us this is where it started. And of course, we know from the book of Enoch and other extra biblical books that they say that this is about, a, it was an exchange. It was a transaction, technology for a, a woman. Essentially. Is, so then we talk about these sons that are the creators of these things, right? That's not too unlike the demigods or, or like, like Hermes, these different mythological you know, 
gods and little g gods that we that we see in Greek mythology and actually across most mythologies that exist, Roman, Greek, Greek, uh, Mesopotamian, Egyptian, you have these gods that impart technology to people. Is it and is that are we talking about the same thing here too? Is it, are we is that possible? Absolutely. That- Absolutely. And and that's what I tell people. I said, what mm-hmm. if I told you that all the mythologies, you know, Hercules, Achilles, all these beings, that they were real that they really existed because these, and the Bible even kind of alludes to that because it says that the Nephilim were men of renown. And so it's telling you these guys were super famous in antiquity. And what I say is that these, this, the mythologies of what you mentioned, Greece, Rome, they, they were all based on this real event in Genesis six. And the funny thing is that when you look in history, the church fathers like Justin Martyr, Tertullian, they wrote that clearly. They said that explicitly that, the mythologies of the Greeks were based on this incident in biblical history, this event in biblical history. And uh, one of the things I point to in the book, Atlantis, Plato's Atlantis account. Mm, And I compare mm -hmm. it to not just Genesis six, but another chapter in the Bible that I think is all about this period, which is Ezekiel chapter 31. It's just never really discussed that way. But I think Ezekiel 31 is God speaking to this fallen angel. He, who he calls the Assyrian. And it's all about the Assyrians uh, being the preeminent angel who ruled over this pre-flood kingdom of fallen angels and their Nephilim sons dominating the world. And it goes through his hi- how he rose and all the nations were under his shadow. He ruled over the whole world. And uh, it talks about the other angels. He uses this metaphor of trees. And it says that the trees in the garden of God all envied him. So all the fallen angels were envied him for his power. And in fact, that chapter, Ezekiel 31, mentions the Garden of Eden more than any other chapter in the Bible. And then eventually God punished him with the flood. And so what I do is I I look at Plato's account of Atlantis and I take those chapters and show all the similarities. And so I say, you know, they talk about that in, of course, Atlantis was built, uh, it was it was built by Poseidon because he fell in love, a god fell in love with a human woman and had five sons with him. Uh, with her and her his hybrid offsprings were the the kings the rulers of atlantis and so for, so right from from the start we see this comparison to genesis chapter 6 it references some of the minerals the mineral resources of atlantis are the same ones mentioned in the book of genesis about the garden of eden it talks about gold silver bdellium i mean it's the exact same things that plato mentions mm-hmm. it talks about the abundance of animals of course we know the first job that adam had in the garden of eden was to name all of the animals mm-hmm. and then um there are other comparisons too and then ultimately obviously atlantis was destroyed by a flood and specifically says that this the wickedness of the gods got so uh, out of control that a flood destroyed Atlantis, which again mirrors, obviously, you know, God says the earth was filled with violence in the days of Noah, right? That all flesh had corrupted itself and God destroys the world for its wickedness and for the corruption genetically that was taking place. And then I think one of the most interesting things is that uh, in the book, I have, uh, the, I have an image in the book of Gilgal Raphaim which is in modern day Hebron in Israel, um, which of course is this series of, uh, it's an ancient megalith and it's five concentric circles. It's, it's made from 45 tons of basalt stones, carried up a hill and assembled in five concentric, concentric circles and that you can't even appreciate what the structure is unless it's seen from the air. And it was first discovered by Israeli spy planes um, back in the 60s during the the, uh, the Six Day War. I have an image of that and uh, below it, I have an image of Atlantis from a, a 19th century book on the account by Plato. And what do we see? Five concentric circles of islands in a circle with water in between them. And so it's exactly the same. And so it's a lot of similarities there, man. And then when you think about that, that Plato lived a, a thousand years after Moses, it's pretty easy to see he's where the account is, who had the account first, right? The Bible did. 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 A couple of things we know about the Nephilim is that 
they, you know, being a hybrid being, they were huge, right? They're especially, these are the giants, right? It, it is one and the same. But how big do we think the ones pre flood were? And then they do return after the flood. Uh, yeah, for sure. And, and for, for thoughts sure. on how that happened and, and, you know, were they all, were they all wiped out or not really all wiped out? Or was there a second incursion? There's a lot of theories that we know around that. Yeah. In terms of their size, I think they were, you know, huge, maybe 20, 30 feet or bigger. And so, and, and there's an interesting passage, right, where in uh, Amos chapter two, God is, is, is talking about uh, the Amalekites, Og of Bashan, Og and Sihon, the two Amorite kings, right? I'm sorry, the two Amorite kings uh, who Moses has to b- battle before entering the promised land. And God says that their height, this is, the, this is God speaking. He says that they're, they are as tall as the Lebanese cedar. The Lebanese cedar tree can grow to a hundred feet. And so, so these, so these, they were big and these, and they were post flood giants. So I think they were really big. I think they got smaller as time went on. Cause when you get to the, to David, Wait, and those, Goliath, were, those were post, those were post flood. Yeah. Og and Sion were post flood. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so yeah, so I think they were truly giants, not just, you know, this wasn't Shaquille well, O'Neal. This was, like, these were guys Manu who Bull, were 20 right? feet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, our last guest, one of our last guests, Michael Tellinger, we brought him on. He's from South Africa. He's, He's got fossilized bones of these things. Some of them, the, the shoulder blades are as big as car doors. He's got, he's, he shows on his YouTube channel some of these hearts that look like the size of a Volkswagen bug. And he thinks that, you know, 3000 L, what they say in the Book of Enoch, he thinks they were up to, you know, four or 500 foot tall giants. Um, how does that fit into this story? Because I mean, there's a lot of guys we brought on are like anything over 10 foot's crazy. It's really weird the uh, the discrepancy amongst you know you get into the you get into the realm of the giants and it's like you're open minded enough to believe in these things, but then all of a sudden you're like, well, they couldn't be bigger than 15 foot. Why is that the size discrepancy so debated amongst people who believe in this stuff? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know because I, I think you know the evidence in the Bible, there's so many, not so many things, but there's things in Bible and in history that you can point to. So when you look at Og, they say that Og, the King Og, um, they said that his, his bed was over 13 feet long. And it was, a, it was basically kept as a museum item. They say in the, in the capital city of the Ammonite kingdom that he was mm. kept as a museum item. So that's one thing you see there. Uh, like I said, God compared him to Lebanese cedars. And then you, you can even see, uh, in Numbers chapter 13, when the Israelites, Moses sends the 12 spies to go scout out the land of Canaan that's filled with Nephilim, they see three giants there, the sons of Anak, Ahiman, Seshai, and Talmai. And that passage really blew me away because the Israelites had just left Egypt. They just saw God perform the 10 plagues on the most powerful, the superpower empire of that time, the Egyptian empire. And they saw God destroy Pharaoh and the entire army at the Red Sea. God parts the Red Sea. The Israelites go through. He kills the, all the armies in the sea. Hmm. And yet about maybe 10 days later, they see three giants and they're saying, God can't beat these guys. They're so scared of them. They say, God cannot beat these guys. And remember, when they went to scout the land, the grapes that they brought back, it took two men to carry a, cust- a cluster of grapes on a pole, you know, on their shoulders. So even the food they were eating was giant, enormous, you know, way. So these are, so I, I think they were way over 10 feet, these guys. No, I'll say Luke and I were actually debating before you came on the show if the Devil's Tower in Wyoming is actually a giant tree stump that the the megafauna of the ancient days could have been huge. Do you think some of those are fossilized remains of giant trees and giant beings? It, and it, it definitely could be. I, I really think I, I I bring all of this genetic manipulation back to that era. Even the dinosaurs, I think, were a product of genetic manipulation by the angels, which is why they weren't. God was not interested in keeping those creatures after the flood. And you see, the instructions to Noah were bring on animals after their kind. Yeah. Birds after their kind. God specifically saying, I want genetically pure birds. Don't right. bring on a half bird, half lizard. <laughs> bring on the bird, just full bird. And yeah. so, so yeah, I, I attribute all that to it. And it could have been with trees too as well. So, I mean, because we see, I, and, and, and this is the amazing thing. These little details in the Bible tell so much. Because how did they have grapes that were probably weighed? If two guys have to carry, they probably, probably weighed 100 pounds. Plus, that's that's crazy. Yeah. Well, I so, mean, uh, one of the things we talked about with with uh, Dr. Judd when he was on was about sure. and, antediluvian times and and essentially scientifically looking at the fact that based on our fossil record, we know there was a lot 
a lot more nitrogen in the atmosphere. And more oxygen. It's that's what it, that's what it yeah. was. So they talk about what they do with fish, yeah. right? They put they hyper oxygenate oxygenate water, and they put fish in, and fish grow to like you know twenty times what they're supposed to. And you go post then, where things have changed, and now it rains, and now there's these you know you have the second incursion of the was the Rephaim, which which would be the the risen ones, the 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 post flood uh, Nephilim, and they're not as big. Um, are you are you a survivor or are you a second incursion? As far as, <laughs> yeah. far as that goes. <laughs> Great question. What party am I in? Yeah, exactly. I am, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am actually a uh, survivor, DNA survivor. So I, I, my, my whole position is that the DNA of the Nephilim came through on the ark, particularly in the wives of Noah's sons and specifically on the wife of Ham. And, uh, and I think there's some good support for that in the scriptures. I think there's some biblical support for that. And I think that, there's a very interesting thing about Noah um, in the details of his life in the Bible is that when you look again at the genealogies of the patriarchs, most, and it just kind of goes right to what you're saying, Luke. I, I totally believe that there was a hyperbaric atmosphere before the flood. And that's why we have the expanded lifespans um, of all the, of the patriarchs. You have people living 700, 800 years. And I think even the maturation process was different. The actual puberty was different. Because you see men having their first children at 60 years old. So I think the maturation process was even different because they, you know, they waited so long to have their first children. So we're, you're saying they're not all Mick Jagger? They're not all just, just, just getting, <laughs> exactly. Mick Jagger. Wrapping, wrapping it up late in life, you know? Like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Going strong. Right. I don't even think Mick Jagger can grow a beard yet. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> oh, we're ahead of him there. That's for sure. Um, yeah. Well, and Nate's got kids. I don't have kids yet, so I'm, I'm on the yeah. later side. But I mean, yeah, you're right. 60 years. What was it? Sarah was, gosh, when she was 99. Yeah. Well, well, speaking of all that, uh, Aided and Zilla, I mean, I really like what you're talking about because no one's really talked about, we've just kind of gone from the sons of God to the giants. And then we've been talking about on the show how big they were. And that's kind of been our, a little bit of our obsession, but you're talking about this kind of original corrupt family. Yep. And how, one of my thoughts on all this is how does a woman give birth to a giant? Have you thought about that? Like, how does this happen? Uh, I've definitely thought about it. I've definitely researched it. And, you know, there is lots of theories out there. There's theories that the woman dies at birth, you know, at, you know, at delivery. I'm not dogmatic on this at all, but my feeling is that maybe they just start off as just a large baby and their growth is just super accelerated. So by the time they're three months old, they're the size of a five-year-old child. And by the time they're a year, they're the size of a teenager and so on. So, and why giants you think, like, why do they be grow up to become giants of all things? Like, it's just, why not just like supernatural beings that are just intelligent and, and maybe deformed? Why are they, why, why the size? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. I never really thought about that. It's just, I think it's just, it's just, I think it's just something in the combination of human angelic genetics, right? I think, and I, and I talk about this too, that, you know, our physiologies are somewhat similar. I mean, and I'm talking about human and angelic physiology. We know from the Psalms that it says man did eat angels food in the wilderness. So the manna from heaven is actual food that angels eat. You know, when the angels, two angels uh, come with Jesus to see Abraham in Genesis 15, when they, uh, when he visits him and tell him he's going to have a son, they eat food. Abraham right. prepare has they prepare food. They're able to eat human food. So we have some similar physiology, but there's something about putting our genetics together that just blows it up. And <laughs> we have a super size. Dude, imagine yeah. imagine that pressure though, man. You gotta feed Jesus and two angels. You better bring your egg yeah. in culinary. I mean that's <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Jesus is really eating at the wedding of the lamb all the time, and you're you're going to see Abraham. Yeah. Well, you better bring it. I mean, you're absolutely right. better than that manna <laughs> stuff they're dropping for the Israelites. Right? <laughs> exactly. Oh man, I, I, yeah, I, th- I think the whole birth thing is interesting. If the combination yeah. of DNAs made, you know, made these hybrid beings that were huge, I don't know. It's a lot, it's a lot of you, you can get off on a rabbit hole there. We could talk like we're on uh, coast to coast about, you know, why how big are these things yeah. and why bigger? Why are they big? Well, but, yeah, I mean, um, well, there's something to it, right? So, I mean, think about it this way: you have lots of encounters. You know, in the Old Testament, definitely, you know, when people see angels, you know, sometimes they're, you know, or and in the New Testament, you know, they're, they're passing out. Daniel passes out when he sees right. the angel Gabriel and he gets revived and passes out again. So <laughs> yeah. when they, sh- when they reveal how they truly look, it's scary. So I imagine they probably have, they're probably bigger than us for people that, that you know, and they're always saying, do not be afraid when they show up, they have to like give that preamble, do not be afraid. 
because everyone's it's like it's almost like when you see them it's like man i'm a, i'm gonna i'm about to die right now yeah so i think there's something to be said that they probably are maybe not giants but larger than an average human being in addition to probably emanating divine light and other properties i've looked into this and it gets really complicated that sometimes the angel of the lord is the lord appearing as an angel yeah and it, it, he can't even appear as himself because it would just you would Human die, right? Would just, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's like he t- it's like he takes over the body of an a- it's, of an angel. It's kind of complicated theology. Yeah, yeah. I want to fast forward. Can we fast forward? Because I, mean, I know that this, we're, we've talked about ancient times now, and I know that what some of what you're writing about now is is about about now and end times. So if we're talking about the days of Noah, if those times, and, and we talked about the technology and the mark of the beast and the ability now, the connectedness of the world. Um, yeah, yeah. So if one of the things that we talk, the revelation talks about, and, and I think it's specific to the, some of this podcast too, is that the, that those days will be like the days of Noah. And do you find correlation between that prophecy and then the fact that we are, we are in a time where people are regularly seeing things like Bigfoot and regular, see, regularly seeing things like UFOs. And, uh, we talked about, we talked to a buddy, uh, one of our, our guests who said that there's the sightings of goat man down in Texas are off the charts as, as crazy and weird as that sounds. It's like, are we now treading in a place where this, these incursions and these creatures and these things are, are returning? Yeah, for sure. And I think there's two reasons for that, uh, biblically. So one, I mean, you already mentioned it as it was in the days of Noah, Jesus told us it's going to be like this in the days before he comes, returns. And Bring home, I tried to bring home in the first book, but I really want to emphasize in the second book is that in the days of Noah, you had fallen angels openly manifesting. They were on the earth. You could see them. You can interact with them. They were marrying people. They were exchanging things with husbands and fathers. So the end times is the exact same thing, that you're going to have fallen angels manifesting on earth. And so you have the Revelation 12. We see that when Satan again is evicted, it says he and the fallen angels are cast down to the earth. It says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because the devil has come upon you, having great wrath, for he knoweth his time is short. So he and all the fallen angels come to earth. And then you have the abyss opened and you have all the Genesis six angels released again. And so it's, it's, it's like a repeat of the flood, right? When the flood right. happened, you had the windows of heaven open, water came down the first rain ever. And then you had the, the fountains of the deep. You so see you had water coming from below the earth and from the sky. So now we're going to have a fallen angelic flood right on earth. Right. So they're going to be here manifesting. And so I think what's happening now in this prelude, as we get closer, you're going to have more demonic interaction, demonic sightings. And we see this in the Gospels. In the first coming of Jesus, there is a massive amount of demonic activity. Jesus is casting out demons left and right. You know, you have the man who had several thousand demons in him. He called himself Legion. So, and I think that, I think that was a, there's something connected to the appearance of Christ on earth and this permission of more demonic manifestation in that time that's going to take place. And so I think it's only going to ramp up in, as we approach the great tribulation and tying into UFOs, it's the same thing. I totally think that, you know, the UFO phenomenon is a demonic manifestation. And, you know, I, I, in my new book, I quote John Keel, you know, who was the base of the Mothman prophecies, Fox Mulder and the X-Files is based on his life, life and lifelong uh, UFO UFOlogist. And his ultimate conclusion after years and years of research was that the UFO phenomenon was a spiritual manifestation. He kind of switched his whole hmm. paradigm from saying these, these are extraterrestrial beings from other solar systems to saying this is no different than the demons from the Bible. And so uh, that will even see its full, I think it's probably its fulfillment in the Great Tribulation once we are gone, once we are taken in the rapture. The interesting thing is that when it says the angels come down to earth with the devil, it doesn't say what they're going to do. Yeah. So we don't know. We can. We might think they're going to come down here and tear tear things up. But what if they come and say, we are from another solar system. We are your right. creators. We right. seeded you yeah. in thousands of years ago. And now we're back to help you evolve into your next phase, you know? Yeah. That sounds like ancient aliens. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. The ancient alien show kind of does that. It, it, I'm with you. I mean, th- this is the ancient alien theory. This is the whole idea that, that aliens came down and, and they gave everybody technology and it's ancient technology. And it's like, well, from a biblical worldview, this, this makes a ton of sense. And then the UFO thing makes a ton of sense. If we talk about, you know, there's fact there's 11 dimensions that we mathematically cannot 
unproved that there's 11 of them. Yeah. And if, you know, and that's the same as saying there's realms, right? There's another realm we can't see that exists. We live in three dimensions and there's a fourth dimension. Well, that's the things that the cross between the third and the fourth is really just the spiritual realm into the physical, right? And that's exactly, that's what we're saying. Yeah. I feel like with the whole UFO thing, when people go down the the Tom DeLonge trail and they think they're coming from other planets, yeah. I mean, how how are we still alive? I mean, if <laughs> if they have this technology, why are we even here? Right? It has to be, it has to be that there is someone protecting the third and the fourth dimension from from colliding. That's how I feel about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I think you guys are on the money and and mentioning you know the eleven dimensions. I think even science is headed that way. So. You know, in, in, in the in the beginning of the book, I talked a lot about quantum physics. In the in the opening of the book, because I really want to establish, I think that quantum physics is science validating the spiritual realm and really recognizing that the spiritual realm exists. And they talk about the and, and I think that really, if you look at quantum physics, what they're saying, they're really contradicting evolution. That things are just progressing at a natural rate and everything is certain, all matter is certain. It's saying, no, it's totally uncertain and it's totally unpredictable. And subatomic particles actually don't even behave the same way when you observe them and all these ideas. And so I think that, um, you know, so things like CERN and all these things, it's all, it's all about basically accessing the spirit realm, like that dimension. And so uh, it's all converging, right? It's all, it's all converging. And I think that ultimately when you think, you know, revelation itself is about the revelation of this dimension, of the fourth dimension, like th that now the, the barrier, whatever you want to call it, the, the, the curtain the, the veil. will be pulled yeah. back, the veil will be pulled back. And now we're going to see again, as it was in the days of Noah, now the, the heavenly realm and the earthly realm are going to be completely interacting. And so, uh, so yeah, so I definitely think that, that this all, all these things, these can tie into this delusion to set the world up, to accept these beings that are coming from this other dimension wow. the, from the spirit realm. And I mean, and then it makes sense in that, in that, right. If we, if there is sort of a, uh, a close encounter of the, what is it, the third kind or the fourth kind, whatever they say, like, that makes a lot of sense in, in what we consider like a modern day Jesus tale, right? Like somebody that comes down to be the savior of the earth that's from another planet. And that, I mean, I, I just, I don't know. I just thought of that. I mean, it's this. Could... Exactly. It all, it all, it all ties in. Right. And so one of the things that, uh, that really kind of blew me away in my research was I found, uh, a writing by Hippolytus. Hippolytus was essentially three generations removed from John, the apostle John, in terms of him being, uh, mentoring Polycarp, who discipled Irenaeus, who discipled Hippolytus. And so he wrote the oldest extant writing on the book of Revelation. It's called the Christ and Antichrist. And in it, he, he writes about this whole scene. He basically says, imagine if you had thousands of angels in the sky, glowing, you know, with this divine light, singing, you know, with angelic voices, but they're fallen angels. But they're presenting themselves as these beautiful beings. You know, he basically says, how would the world react if they saw that in the sky? And if you think about it, you know, when Christ was born, you had angels doing that to the shepherds. They appeared in the sky to the shepherds singing to the birth of the Messiah. And so he says, imagine, basically saying, imagine if that happens again in the end times. But they're fallen angels. And they say that there's, there are these benevolent beings. Oh, and by the way, our God, our Savior, who's your Savior, is now here. And they're pointing to the Antichrist. And right. so, you know, when you think about it on that scale, like, you know, the unsaved world can really, really be deceived. Once we have fourth dimensional beings in front of you, it's very easy to start worshiping them, to see them as God, to see them as our creators. This is, this is the strong delusion. And so right. it's like they say, you know, there's no atheists in the foxhole, there are no atheists in the Great Tribulation. When you see these beings, no one's an atheist anymore. That's out the window. Yeah, it's like it's a great counterfeit, right? Like the great deceiver wants to create the perfect counterfeit. It's the uh, it's funny you say that because there's people that I've heard stories about people in the occult, and it backs up what people talk about in scripture, where Satan is is supposed to be absolutely beautiful, like so beautiful yep. that it's that you almost can't look. You know, maybe the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Like there's. Yep. Story. I mean, I, this is a rabbit hole at some point, but there's stories. I I know of friends that work in Haiti and had a friend that they had, they rescued this girl out of out of the voodoo temple and and she goes on to talk about being present for human sacrifices and you know Satan is not an omniscient being. He's not everywhere like God is, right? He, but for whatever reason, on this night he showed up at this thing and she said it was the most beautiful thing she had ever seen. And yeah. and it's like 
if you that doesn't like freak you out in the sense of like that everything we that we know is for me and this whole thing is is interesting too it's like the more that we think we find out and know the more you realize that we actually do already knew right it's already been given to us in scripture it's not that we're right that we're learning yeah. it's it's that or, or you know find out these all these fourth dimensions it's quantum physics right well the, and the angels knew about this and when these yeah. fallen angels showed up to the angels they worshiped them as gods and the, and these fallen angels ruled over these civilizations and we're, it's everything comes full circle right if you can't exactly. if you don't learn from history you're doing to repeat exactly. it and here we go right and, and that's and that's quantum physics as well right because i talked about this whole idea of quantum superposition that jesus is you know jesus he's beginning and end he was and is and is to come so he exists in t- multiple times simultaneously right and bible the bible itself as, as you know time to god is not linear it's like a scroll and so there are cycles of things that will repeat over and over again. And Jesus tells us that he even says, as it was in the days of Lot, well, what do you have in, in Sodom and Gomorrah? You had a group of men trying to have relations with two angels, right? So even that was an allusion to Genesis six and God, what does God do? He wipes them out immediately. Yeah. And so, uh, so yeah, so it's all, it's all going to repeat yeah. again. It's for crazy. sure. It's crazy. Do you think things like quantum computing are just like a, a computer that's like an Ouija board? It's just, it's just tapping in and getting answers from the occult and from the demonic realms or. Yeah, probably. All right. I mean, there's so much, I mean, when you think about, you know, so many of the greatest inventions, you know, come, you know, when you talk about the modern day great inventions, there's like this whole overlap of people, you know, taking LSD and then you're inventing computers, you know? So it's like, so, you know, I mean, so I, and I say that to say that, you know, there's a big yeah. overlap between people who are accessing the spiritual realm and having these phenomenal scientific revelations, you know? So there's, I think it's all, it's really kind of tied in. And, and of course, again, going back to antiquity, the great thinkers were openly spiritualists, right? They were yeah. the shamans, the people, the medicine men. So these are, they, so the science and spirituality just got separated in modern times, but they were always pretty much the same thing. And I think that you can think of quantum con- computing, of CERN, and even the idea of inspiration, right? It has the word spirit in it, right? This, uh, the whole notion of inspiration is that a spirit is coming into you inspiring. to give you an idea. Yeah. Speaking of modern times, do you think that's what is going on the last 250 years? Is we're trying to get humans to a place where we're, we're being set up um, with science and technology that nothing is spiritual. And then all of a sudden these angels come out of the sky, Bigfoot comes out of the woods, whatever happens, is, is it sort of like priming humans to think nothing is spiritual? And then all of a sudden the, the, the big switch? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because right, right? what had to happen was you had to have a strong... You know, when you have the printing press and the Bible just going all over the world, just in, I mean, in a ridiculous, I mean, it's the most popular book on the world, on the planet, you know, you needed a strong spiritual counter action to that. And so that's what we see in the late 1800s, all the spiritualists, again, Aldous Huxley, Aleister Crowley, all these guys who are just promoting either uh, evolution, science over and reason, or just Satanism and the occult, you know, and pushing the Bible away. But what I notice is that now in, 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 it's very recent now, like in the most recent years, we're seeing a return to spirituality, but it's pagan spirituality, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. again, coming from wall street where I come from, you know, my, so I started my career, you know, 16, 17 years ago, if I went to my law firm, you would never find uh, a, a female attorney walking around dressed in her suit and she has an energy crystal hanging on her neck. Now you see that all the time. People who are total professionals, they're not uh, hippies living out in a commune. These are just total professional people and they're in, they, have, uh, they have gurus, they have energy crystals, they're trying to go to channeling sessions, they're going on ayahuasca trips. I mean, this stuff is now becoming very, very popular in mainstream society. So I think we've gotten rid of the Bible or put enough doubt on Christianity where now we can start bringing spirituality back, but take us to a way that's going to take us right to the, the arms of the fallen angels and their influence. And that brings up a good question is like how, like, you know, one guest said that, you know, like sometimes they the demons were sort of described as if they could be, you know, harnessed for good. And there was this kind of ambivalence there. Like, how do you know? And it, it brought up a bunch of questions of like, you know, when you're dealing with the spiritual realm, when you're doing crystals or you're doing Ouija boards or stuff, how do you know like which side you're on and which yeah. entity you're dealing with and what's yeah. too far? 
It, you know, it's a, yeah, that's a great question. The Bible tells us, right? You have to test the spirits. Do they testify that Jesus is the Messiah? You know, Acts 16, I was just talking about this passage today. You know, you have, you have uh, the disciples encounter a woman who's possessed by a demon who could tell the future. You know, she says she is making her masters a lot of money because she was a fortune teller. And when she sees the apostles, she says, these men shall lead you in the way of God. So she says something that's positive about them, but she's possessed by a demon. And so you, so you have to be very, very careful to not be deceived by them. So that's why, you know, dabbling in trying to access the spirit realm without God is always treacherous. That's how I see it. Because to me, that's all the occult is. You're just accessing the fourth dimension without God. You're not praying to God directly. You're using... You're scrying, you're using a Ouija board, you're using some other means to try and access that. You're taking a drug to try and access the spiritual dimension. A DMT. And so I think, yeah. 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 It's like Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan's like a, a Oracle now. It's a DMT, he flies it out of space. He, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And look how popular he is, right? Oh, I mean, crazy. He's, he's, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. He's, he's really, I mean, it's like even him. I mean, he's super popular. I mean, he's, he's, he's a great show host, but he's pushing a spirit. He has a spiritual agenda big time. Yeah. So some, some some of the Bigfoot accounts I've heard, guys go out in the woods, they start getting uh, uh, spiritually attacked. What do you think about some of those those encounters that people describe about dogman, werewolves, Bigfoot, where it's associated with kind of this evil entities, and then they they can mind speak to you, they can get in your head, and they can like they can hear voices. Uh, what do you think about that stuff? Is that because you're out looking for Bigfoot and you're not taking it serious, or? Or- yeah, so I think there's two. So yeah, so I think there's some credibility to that, right? There are spiritual forces out there, there are demonic forces out there, and you never know if they could possess, right? We know, right? For example, again in scripture, we see that demons can even possess animals, right? Jesus cast demons into pigs. So, you know, how you know, so they can possess they can take on bodies. And so, and I think there's something to say, there's something to be said, I think, for locations that certain locations, like there maybe that demonic forces might be restricted to a certain location. So if you happen to go there, whether you know it or not, you might be entering a location where demons manifest. Yeah, the principalities, right? That, these people, have, they have dominion. They have, exactly. Or these people, not these right. people, but these spirits have, the spirit, yeah, have that's dominion. Right, right? These yeah. dominions, principalities, powers, that they have locations, right? Deuteronomy 32 says God divided the nations up according to the sons of God. So they, they, they're territorial. Right. So and, that's why uh, people go missing in the woods. Yeah, yeah. There you go. And so the, the, e- yeah. even the, uh, you know, there's the account of the uh, the demoniac, the demon-possessed man in the Gardarines, right, in the Gospels, that Jesus encounters this man who's tearing himself up. They put him in chains. He breaks out of the chains, and he's he's insane. But he was in the tombs. So I always th- I always say, what was he doing there in the first place? Why was he in the tombs to begin with? So I think I really think that there was a demonic presence at these tombs, and they t- it took him over. To the wow. point that he got possessed there. So I think there's really something to a, a territorial aspect where if you go a certain place, you might encounter them and they might be in the form of a Bigfoot or Chupacabra or whatever it may be. So I got one more question. I got one more question for you. Yes, what sir. do you what do you think about people say like the white hats or the good wizards or the the good shamans, the good mediums? Are, are, is that is that a, a false flag? Is that a, uh, what, what are they tapping into? Are there people who speak for God and they're not on the side of these angels, fallen angels? I, no, I think most of it's false flag, right? So I think people can, can preach, people can prophesy. But once you're talking about like a shaman where they're doing a specific ritual to access the realm, they're not praying, they're not going to scripture and then getting a word. They are going, they're doing something that's completely outside of the Bible, um, a technique. Uh, I think that's all, all bad. Yeah. It's all of the, on the fallen side. Even if they present themselves, again, as benevolent beings or they talk to a spirit that says, oh, I know your mom, and she says hello, and it's nothing bad. It's all a deception. I think all of those things, and we have to be very, very wary of those things because, you know, again, like even in the end times, right, I think that's, you know, uh, like the false prophet, for example, you know, who he's going to, who I also think is not going to be just a normal person. He's going to be probably a possessed being or some type of hybrid creature. But I think he's going to, I think he's going to be seen as the ultimate. He's going to be like the Dalai Lama on steroids, this ultimate, peaceful, wise, benevolent, caring being, right? He's not coming to fight anybody. He says, you know, he has horns as a lamb. So he presents himself as a peace loving, gentle, meek, spiritual guru. 
but he's leading everyone obviously to damnation. So we have to be very yeah. He's a Trojan horse. It's completely, yeah. completely. So I think that's so the so these little false prophets right now are just a preview of what he's going to be because I think he's going to blow the world away to think, wow, this was this was the true religion all along. Is basically what the world is going to think and follow him. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 interesting. And when you you know some thoughts I have when you talk about Judas being taken over. I mean, I know I said last question, but do you do you feel some people in the world today that are leading the free world are possessed like Judas and they're making decisions and they're they're I mean, the world feels in 2020 like we're we're seeing the veil thinning and we're seeing who's really running the show and it feels connected to these entities of the old days. I feel heavy. I feel a heaviness, like something's flying around in the air. It just feels dark. Do you do, do you see the veil thinning? Definitely. <laughs> yeah, de- yeah. 2020 has definitely established that, right? I think, this, I think we are in the birth pangs, which means we're going to see this more and more. And to your first question, can people be possessed? Absolutely. You know, but I definitely, I definitely believe that demon possession can still happen today in modern times. But without people knowing it, like ripping chains. Sure. And, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Un, yeah. Unknowingly, yes, they can be uh, possessed. And I think the important thing that we have to remember, right? So Noah, you know, he built the ark, right? He was building the ark, preparing, but he was also a preacher of righteousness, right? And we have to. We know these things, and even even in the church, like even among other Christians, not just people who are unsaved and don't believe in Christ, but even for people in the church who don't know anything about Bible prophecy, we have to wake people up. And I always say, you know, we have to, our job now is to get people on the ark, as many people as possible, because, you know, the thing about the ark is that when Noah finished it, God was the one who closed the door. When he walked on and got all the animals on, it says, God shut the door. So that was it. That was the end. We, and so that's going to happen again and we'll be on the ark, but we have to make sure we get other people right. on. So we have to, when we see what's happening now, what you guys, the work you guys are doing and sharing this mess, it's so important. You know, it's so important that we talk about prophecy, that we talk about the second coming, that we say, hey, we need to talk about Bigfoot. We need to talk about aliens because guess what? This stuff is all going to manifest. And if we're left here with no answers, and people are watching church programs where they never even talk about these things. Well, what's going to happen? They're going to say, well, these must, these, these must be our real gods who are coming. Right. And so what you guys are doing, this is what we need to do. Because this is how people will get on, get in Christ and get saved before the great delusion comes. So I think, yes, we, I do think we're heading towards those times. I do feel this hap- being ramped up in 2020. Yeah. But I think it makes it much more, that much more urgent to continue for you guys to continue to do what you're doing. Thanks, Ryan. We really appreciate yeah, same with it. You, Ryan. Like, we have to have you back on, because, or at least have a conversation outside of this, because there's just so many things now that you brought up that I'm thinking about that it just it just makes you think. It just I think the one thing I think about that Nate and I try to talk about in all this is that there's a lot of things that that get disregarded, or a lot of things that get pushed to away from the mainstream conversation because uh, they fall outside of your sort of empirical scientific method thought. When you put context on, it, especially historical context, there's so much. I, I just, I just can't, cannot see how you can look at these things and not see it differently. Tell us, uh, tell everybody out there listening where they can find you, where they can find your book, um, and where, where the, perhaps they could, they could learn more about the things you're doing, Ryan. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my, my website, I actually have two websites. My website is judgmentofthenephilim.com. You can go there, find information about my books, lots of my videos that I do. It's also my YouTube channel is Judgment of the Nephilim. My Facebook is Judgment of the Nephilim uh, and my Instagram. So you can find me there easy. If you're interested in just articles on all sorts of topics, uh, dealing with end times, the spiritual manifestations, all these things, my blog is beginningandend.com. And that's just all articles I put there and podcasts and all these types of topics. So um, those awesome. are the main ways to, to find me. Yeah, awesome. you know, Bigfoot Bigfoot goes from Ada to Zilla. Right? <laughs> Look at this guy's got he's a dad. He's got dad jokes. Hey, hey, <laughs> hey, hey. Hey, I'm trying to work I'm trying to work on that, Nate. That's good. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Or you know, that's what we do on Blurry Creatures. We're trying to figure out what Bigfoot is. It goes back to the Bible times. It yeah, gets really yeah. spiritual and you can't figure it out unless you ask these bigger questions. Absolutely. And one of the things over the last ten years that really frustrated me was like, hey, people stay in boxes when they talk about Bigfoot, Dogman, whatever. And I love that we're out of the box. I love all your ideas. I love that you Thanks. connected it. 
and gave us just this view into this ancient family that kind of screwed up everything. Yeah. And, you know, this this sort of the par- parasite plot to destroy humanity. And that's something I learned on this show, and I really appreciate it. And uh, listen, listeners, yeah. go check it out. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Get, get the books, and uh, hopefully we can talk again soon. Yeah. Guys, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Take care. Yeah. God bless. Thanks. All right.